The following episode contains or may contain spoilers. So if you're spoiler sensitive, maybe beware. Yeah, you sensitive people. Get out. (laughs) (laughs) No, get in. In, in <laughs> <laughs> so welcome to the phantom zone three fans one podcast oh man did i mess that up or no i was doing it right man <laughs> and a sea of comics <laughs> <laughs> y'all know the drill this is like <laughs> way into it i don't do i have to say it every time probably not but i like you to. should people love <laughs> yeah. that kind of consistency <laughs> and it is on our merch that's coming out real soon. Just saying. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So today we have a very special Patreon fan pick episode. Yay! Uh, by Mr. Sean Fleming. So he actually gave us a pretty interesting topic. And he wanted us to talk about Batman, the animated series, and kind of just what our favorite episodes were and talk about it that. Yeah, go from there. <laughs> like I like these ones where we have to watch something because <laughs> I read a lot for school, so <laughs> it's always nice to have a little break. It's a brain break. <laughs> hmm. I love that he gave us an episode that we already really wanted to do. <laughs> yeah. Oh, right. Yeah. Oh no, we have to go out of our way. <laughs> yeah. There's been a few. I think the last two. Like we have this whole list of episodes we want to do. And we get super excited when somebody mentions one on that list because it's like, oh, cool. Now we don't have to, like, decide which one we have to do. It's, you know, you just gave it to us right there. Yeah, exactly. So, mm-hmm. so also, as always, if you want to pick an episode, go to Patreon, do the stuff that's on there, and then give us your topic. Super Become easy. a patron. Patron? <laughs> uh, control our minds. pretty much yeah and people like to give us a a variety of topics so you're more than welcome to do that as well um so you guys want to jump right into it into the batman animated universe i mean if i have to talk about batman i guess i will (laughs) well as a person who's not really a batman fan i feel like i'm the most qualified to begin this discussion here's the thing (laughs) i (laughs) no but i almost mean that which is i'm not that big a batman fan But I have to say, this is the single greatest ongoing cartoon series adapting a comic that's ever been. Oh, for sure. Yeah, I love it. Without a doubt. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I mean, it. it, so it did star in 1992, which is as old as Kayla and myself. Yeah, that's the year I was born, so I obviously wasn't watching it as it was coming out. (laughs) <laughs> nope. <laughs> but I do remember I do remember it being on TV, but I'm pretty sure that was just reruns. But yeah. 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 yeah I mean, I, I think this show so it it changed how people and the general audience and even in comics how it, it just changed the world of Batman. I mean, from the introduction. The introduction is absolutely anybody could recognize that introduction. It's so iconic and it just gives it sets the stage for what the series is going to be through the whole opening sequence. Yeah. I mean, if, from, you know, the the mobsters and stuff running from him to him being on the rooftop with the lightning in the background. Like, I mean, wh- how much more Batman could you possibly want? <laughs> Do you nerds want to hear some trivia? Sure. Sure. The, op- the opening sequence is actually just an adaptation of the animated short that we use, was used as the pilot. Oh, man. Yes, but almost beat for beat. So this is how they kind of like they created it and like kind of presented it and sold it to the network. And on that basis, it got greenlit, uh, which is why it's so goddamn cool. Yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I like that a lot. Well, and I feel like on kind of an unprecedented level, um, because I know most media adaptions kind of just function in their own, like they're kind of based off of the source material, but kind of do their own thing. I think that's kind of typical with all like movie, television, video game adaptions of of, like comics. But Mm -hmm. the comics absorbed so much from the animated series, which I just think speaks very, very highly of the quality and just the content of what was coming out during the show. 
Oh, for sure. I mean, even with characters that were introduced, like Harley Quinn in the animated series, that have become such iconic characters and even people's favorite comic book characters to this day. I mean, it, it it's really, I mean, we know that in movies, especially like the MCU, they'll try, they'll kind of translate some stuff that happened in the movie in the comics, and it doesn't usually go over too well. Like, even just like the aesthetic of how they look. Yeah. Um, but with this one, it was just, I mean, it's amazing. I mean, it, it, there's no, I don't think there's another series that was able to do what it has done. I mean, it just set the bar super high for Batman. Yeah. So Harley Quinn was created, like you mentioned. Uh, Renee Montoya got a start in the series. Mm-hmm. Um, it was actually one of those things about Renee Montoya. It, we've, I can't remember what character was like this. She actually, no, it was Aqualad. Um, she appears in the comics first, even though she was created for the animated series. It's a weird situation. Oh, that's right. I forgot about that. Because they knew she was coming out. They liked the idea. I can't remember what writer, and they adapted her because it's way easier to like produce a comic and put it out before the animated series or whatever. And, mm-hmm. But when, when the show wasn't introducing amazing new characters that would then be adapted in the comics, it was recreating some of their origins and making them better. So it created an origin for Mr. Freeze. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I was this close to spotlighting that episode because of the changes that they made to his background, as opposed to like hokey mad scientist that does a lot of ice puns. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, they made him this fantastic, tragic character. And, and yeah, it's fantastic. Yeah, well, I think the cool thing about Mr. Freeze, well, Mr. Freeze's episode, is that it also <laughs> won a daytime Emmy for that. And uh, while I was kind of going through the episodes I wanted to take, that's what was another one of the things that I was just like, maybe I should mention this one because it freaking won an Emmy. But I decided to go in a different direction. <laughs> and it, it absolutely deserves it. It's like Shakespeare level stuff. I mean, it, well, at least based in that kind of drama. Yeah, mm-hmm. of course. I know it added the whole tragic wife background story. <laughs> I actually didn't know that it won any awards. I mean, I, I'm i not surprised that it did. I just, you know, I didn't know that. That's well, interesting. But yeah, like I was saying, I mean, the show is historically, un, you know, kind of unprecedented in a lot of ways. So like we mentioned, one of its episodes wins an Emmy. That's sort of crazy unto itself. But I would suggest another thing that's crazy is that this uh, thing came right after the movie. It was it got greenlit on the basis of the popularity of the Tim Burton movie, which came out in 89. Um, and I would say as much as I, I love Michael Keaton's Batman and I love Tim Burton's Batman, I think this show critically outdoes it. I agree a thousand yeah. percent. <laughs> yeah, I completely agree. I mean, even just with the, the gallery of villains that it introduced or put in there, I mean, it's insane that almost all of Batman's <laughs> pretty much villains were in the show or made an appearance and also his kids. <laughs> well, <laughs> They're- yeah. And absolutely. I mean, it's easy to say, you know, I mean, the animated series had more time. Uh, it could just tell longer stories over a period of time. But if you think about other sort of properties that they've made animated series off of, like the Beetlejuice show or whatever, you could list, you know, dozens upon dozens of them. They almost always feel way less artistically inspired. Mm-hmm. And it, it was such a good move for, I think, I don't know the producer of the vision, but certainly uh, Paul Denny and Bruce Tim um, to rather than just try to simulate Burton's Batman and animated sense to do go off in their own direction. Mm-hmm. And, it, and it rippled throughout the comics. I mean, well, I was going to say kind of piggybacking off of what Noah was saying. What, my favorite part of the animated series is the fact that it did introduce, or, well, not introduce, but it had all of the rogues gallery, which is, I don't know, one of the best things Batman has going for him. Plus, it had some Robins, which a lot of the live action <laughs> stuff just refuses to do or refuses to do right. So, you know, <laughs> I'm a big Wait. fan. <laughs> I think it's I think it's funny how a lot of times uh, when you watch an animated series based on the comic, you're like, oh, this is a decent adaptation of the, of the comic book. This this show is so good. I'll be reading Batman comics and be like, this is a decent adaptation of the show. <laughs> <laughs> You're not wrong. <laughs> and and I am exaggerating a bit, but I do want to say I, this is this was my first real introduction to Batman um, because I 
saw the Batman movie in 89 when I was a really little kid. But this animated series is the first thing I really got to know. And to me, and I'm not alone here, this is in some ways the definitive Batman. At least in the, and not to say it's the best that's ever been written in Batman, but like I consider these like the core of each character, you know? Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. for sure. I'm going to stop talking soon, but uh, <laughs> I, I, there's things, I, I mean, I could talk about this all day. One of the things I'm, I'm fascinated with is this is a, a Saturday morning cartoon show and think about how subdued and subtle it, you know what I mean? Rather than being wacky and everything's exaggerated, these characters, if, any, or if anything, are almost like boiled and scaled down. Yeah. 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 Well, and I think I was reading one of the reviews for the animated show while doing research for the episode. And it was an adult going like, I feel like this cartoon um, kind of lends itself better to like a teenage or adult audience than it does for the actual target audience of like young kids. Because a lot of the episodes, there's just like people talking. There's not a lot of action. There's not a lot of like, ooh, wow, spectacular fight scenes. It's kind of just people talking in different rooms about very serious issues and things that are true to their characters, but something that kids might not find as like engaging. So just, Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know if that lends itself to why it was so critically acclaimed. The fact that it was actually kind of like an adult cartoon as as opposed to like a a typical child cartoon for set, like for Saturday mornings. You, you touch on an important part uh, because I think it, it's really cool of this series that it wasn't just later on in retrospect recognized by, you know, fans that would come to elevate it. It was actually in its time really uh, appreciated. And there's two pieces of evidence for that. One is it got moved from Saturday morning to Sunday night, which was kind of a primetime adult uh, place to put it. Yeah. Um, so they recognized it could could it sort of compete not just for kids but with general audiences, and it also inspired Mask of the Phantasm, which is a movie, a feature film uh. based in this world that was. I mean, it's absolutely wonderful. It's some of the best writing in an animated film, and it got an in theater release. Yeah, huh. and hey. it's and that's one of my favorite Batman movies too. It's so good. The writing is so strong, and for Batman to work and for it to be believable, the writing has to be great. Because, I mean, you have a guy running around in a bat suit fighting a clown. Like, it has to be, it has to be good writing. <laughs> yeah. Well, let's get at that real quick, because I think, uh, before we go on to our episodes, let's talk about some of the pieces of this, because, you know, we've been sort of singing its praises in, the ter- in terms of its, as a whole, you know, piece, or what have you. But the, uh, individual elements are worth pointing out. You Just what you said, the writing and characterization on this show are... To me, the central thing that makes it genius, and I, I don't think it's been beat in the animated world yet. Yeah. I mean, it, well, even, I mean, so the writing, it, and let's not forget about the art. I mean, the color scheme, the art deco design, and like the minimalist costumes of the entire series. I mean, it's just, they didn't, <laughs> they didn't put a bunch of like rubber padding on Batman like he is in the most of his like <laughs> movies or, you know, even in the comic books. And like the Joker went back to his classic mobster look with his purple suit. It's great. I mean, <laughs> it was so simple and it didn't need to be outrageous or overdone because it just worked. And the voice acting just added on top of that. I was going to say the voice acting is spectacular. I, <laughs> as my true art snobby self, the animation, I feel, I mean, like, leave something to be desired. <laughs> I think it looks a little odd. <laughs> but I mean, it, not enough to stop me from loving the show, which is a big deal, guys, because I'm an art <laughs> snob. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I, I c- would concede the point that the art, you know, may have some flaws. But I, to to kind of back up uh, Noah's point, I think the fact that it has a very um, specific art direction in this kind of like scaled down uh, Art Deco thing is to its credit. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, it's it's so it's not just these sort of consistent designs. The the style itself has a kind of like the same power that Art Deco art generally has, which is like these like pillars, godlike characters, and stuff like that. You mentioned the voice actors. I'm going to do something that's going to sound really gratuitous right now. Oh God. But if you go to the IMD page, and I, any listener should do this, the talent of the uh, voice actors uh, is staggering. It's, uh, to me, unprecedented. The amount of not only famous people who were deeply talented actors, but who would do the smallest parts on this show. 
<laughs> this this is a fake one, uh, but like you'd have like Chris Walken being like bellhop number two. Yep. <laughs> but I, yep. but we talk about the voice acting in this a lot, um, and we everybody knows Mark Hamill as the Joker and Kevin Conroy. But I want to read you a list, and like I said, it's going to get gratuitous, but I really want to make this point of actors that were on the show. So strap in real quick. I'll be quick. Um, All right. So you had, you had, just bear with me, you have Jeffrey Tambor, Seth Green, Nichelle Nichols, she played uh, Ahura, uh, Megan Bellali, Richard Jenny, LeVar Burton, Adam West, Joe Piscopo, Ernie Hudson, Adam Ant, the musician, Malcolm McDowell, Brad Garrett, John <laughs> Reese Davis, Heather Lockley, we're almost done, Senator Patrick Leahy, they had a real senator on the show, Tim <laughs> Curry, Tim Matheson, Treat Williams, Dick Miller, Ed Bakley Jr., Kate Mulgrew, she was Janeway from uh, Voyager, Roddy McDowell, Ron Perlman, uh, Mary Lou Henner, and Ed Asner. That's insane. <laughs> <laughs> Not even as like serio- ser- series regulars either. I mean, the, Absolutely. These, these people would be in it for a few episodes or just a character, like a throwaway character. And that's, I, I am shit you not, that is 15% of the names on there. These are just the ones I thought if I read them, you would recognize them. When you look at the IMDb, there are literally 50 other character actors. You're like, oh, I've seen that guy in a thousand things. Yeah. I mean, yeah. To, to, to be honest, I recognize probably like three of the names you said. <laughs> but like your enthusiasm made me think that they were important. So <laughs> but, but all, all of these are relatively big names in Hollywood, especially the character actors sort of thing. But yeah, it's just really fantastic. <laughs> Agreed. I just love picturing Hollywood at that time going like, please let me be in this Batman cartoon. I'll be anything. <laughs> I think that's what happened. I really do. I think that I think based on this, it just must have had such a powerful at the time word of mouth. Um, I think it was probably a lot like the Simpsons or Seinfeld where mm-hmm. people just wanted to be on it. They wanted to be in that sort of group of people. Oh, yeah, I um, would. I'll be on it. I'll I'll be on it now, even though it's not on. Just let me. <laughs> <laughs> and and like I said, I, I think each show the writing is just so top notch. Each show has like this Tales from the Crypt or Twilight Zone level structure to it, mm-hmm. um, where it doesn't feel. I mean, the, the, and and all, they're always connected to either the villain's central psychological motivation or or to Batman's, which is how do you? I don't know. That's so high level to me. <laughs> yeah, I agree. Sophisticated <laughs> show. All right, so I'm gonna go first only because I guess chronologically, my you start with the first episode. <laughs> well, okay, so this is so I always thought it was the first episode. It was technically the second aired episode, but made first. Oh. Can I guess the first one? Sure. <laughs> was it the Christmas one? Yeah. I knew it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so the one I'm doing is on Leather Wings, and it's the Man Bat episode. I love this episode so much. Uh, this is the first. <laughs> <it's so> good. <laughs> it's the first one I ever remember seeing, and it kind of scared me, and also really like captivated me. And it's it's what got me into Batman in the first place. So it wasn't <laughs> even a comic. It was this episode that got me into Batman. You have an actual Batman. And then a guy dressed as a bat oh my God. duking it out. Like, <laughs> it's great. This one is, it deals with really kind of adult themes, especially right off the bat. So Kurt Langstrom, which is man bat, he's addicted to this chemical. These chemicals that turn him into man bat wow. temporarily. Wow, so, you know, starting right off the top with drug abuse. Yeah. And and so he he wants to get the formula and perfect it. To where he'll permanently turn into man bat because you know who wouldn't want to be a giant flying bat? <laughs> I know I'm Batman my, does. I'm raising my hand. <laughs> so yeah, I mean this story. So it deals with Batman investigating this as Bruce as well, which I thought was really cool that they did that really early in the beginning because I think a lot of things that people forget about the animated series or kind of take for granted is that it had a lot of Bruce in it. Yeah. And the comics don't necessarily not I mean recently a little bit but there's been for years there's been where he's hardly Bruce like when he's taking off his cowl that's it but he's not yeah. really doing anything else as Bruce and in this show really put that front and center. Well, and what's interesting able- is 
like the show's version of Bruce Wayne is very like aggressive and hands on, where like in comics he does the whole like Playboy Brucey Wayne thing. right. So yep. he's definitely he acts much more competent as Bruce Wayne in the show, so he can get a lot of shit done. <laughs> Well, especially as like when he's running the company, which yeah, I think exactly. is a big difference. Like he actually acts like a boss <laughs> when he's running the company, <laughs> as opposed to in the movies where he's like, yeah, I don't know what I'm doing. Where's the girl at? <laughs> yeah. It's it's worth mentioning too. That's how you guys might have heard this. That's how uh, Kevin Conroy got the part was that he had a strong differentiation between Bruce and Batman. Mm. Um, and he, he did a strong Bruce, and he so it's weird he got the part almost more on the Bruce Wayne than on the Batman. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah and it, I mean, it's no surprise that this is probably my first pick and one of my favorite episodes because it's it's very horror, like old school horror movie like. Yes, <laughs> and I I, that, I mean that's really why I like this episode so much because it it I really surprised that this kids show went to the addiction themes and then dealing with that and then also making it like a horror movie. So. Yeah, I love it's, it. It's it's Wolfman or Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Yeah. I mean that that's what the story is with Francine and Kirk Langstrom. <laughs> like, you know. Uh. And what a what a beginning too because how, like you're establishing this tone where how tragic the villains are going to be. And mm-hmm. a lot of them are and that's some of these episodes are just wonderful tragedies. Yeah. Yeah, I mean that's, I mean that's really my first pick. That's all that happens in that episode. <laughs> uh, the Batman wins the day. <laughs> yeah, I mean he he feels sorry for him, and then the the bat this show has a really good way of like making you feel sorry for these villains oh, or yeah. for these characters that are going through things. And I know we'll get into it with some of our other picks, but me me yeah. I'm, can, <laughs> can can I add to that my favorite part of this episode because it has this hilarious part in it. Mm-hmm. Um, there's there's this part where Bruce goes uh, to Langstrom's mentor, the older uh, guy, and mm-hmm. uh, like any good horror story, it suggests maybe he's the bad guy, right? So you're very suspicious of him and not of Langstrom. And Bruce has a recording of the man bat animal, uh, and he's bringing it to that guy who's a to that scientist, the older one who's like an expert on bats and stuff like that. And he's like, w- uh, "Can you tell me what this sound is?" And the guy listens to the sound, and he's like, "Oh, it's just uh, bats and starlings fighting over a nest." <laughs> but the sound that they play is the man bat sound, so it's like, <laughs> 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 even as a kid, I'm like, that isn't what they sound like. <laughs> the- the guy that you're talking about is actually Francine Langstrom's father, Dr. Oh, Lynch. great. Mm-hmm. Just wanted to throw that out there because I always thought that was interesting, too, that it's like it was this weird big family affair with yeah. this guy that's addicted to drugs and wanting to become a man bat. It's just it's <laughs> beautiful gothic horror. It's wonderful. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that's my first pick. Yeah, yeah. I'm going next, right? Yes. <laughs> okay. So... Um, this is the one where I was like, do I do Mr. Freeze because his story is so tragic and beautiful now? Instead, I decided to do uh, Two-Face, part one and two, as my first episode. Shut up. Yay. I can pick two I'm, episodes. I'm so glad you were, you did this. <laughs> I know. I actually think the reason I chose this is because I do have, and I keep forgetting this, right? That I have this like fondness for Two-Face and Harvey. Me too. And this is where it began, is watching this these two, technically, these two episodes. Um, <laughs> so this episode is kind of the introduction to Harvey Dent's transformation into Two-Face. Um, he's the district attorney, obviously, running for re-election. But um, they really kind of focus on his mental illness as something that he's kind of always had. It didn't, like, come about after his accident, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, it's always been something that he's been struggling with. So um, that there's like this gangster, Robert Thorne, who's trying to kind of go after Harvey because Harvey's kind of going after him in the name of the law. I mean, that's you brought up a good point, though, because that was one of the things. Like, I loved the interpretation in The Dark Knight of Two-Face. I thought it was really... Yeah, yeah. I the actor that. was really well done. But mm-hmm. his change into the dark side was really quick because, I mean, they brought him... They put him on this pedestal and, you know, he's the white knight and all this stuff. And then I know he goes through some tragedy and stuff, but I I just thought the switch was really quick. But as opposed to the animated series where it was always kind of there. And then once he had the accident, it flipped. 
Yeah, yeah, um, exactly. And, and just real quick, that is something the animated series uh, did first. Mm-hmm. Yep. It, well, it, then, it came yeah. up with the idea of Harvey always being crazy. Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> always being crazy. That's a little insensitive. He was struggling with it. Uh, one of the main parts <laughs> of the first episode, is that, at least, is that you would see his like fits of anger randomly in public. And he when he would snap back to himself, it was almost like he couldn't remember doing that stuff. Yeah. Um, and Bruce is a friend of Harvey Dent. So he was just like, hey, buddy, maybe you should go th- <laughs> to therapy. It might help you. <laughs> And he does. And one of the most, like, impressionable scenes when I was little watching this was when he's talking uh, to the therapist and uh, there's, like, this flash of lightning and it shows Two-Face. And then it just, like, goes away right fast. But it was just, like, this really creepy, eerie scene because there's, like, he's in the therapist's office. There's, like, thunderstorming outside, flashes of lightning, and you see the grotesque face and you're like, oh, my God. (laughs) <laughs> what is that <laughs> um but i think another thing that i feel they don't do enough is like um that the animated show does really well is kind of like a reason to kind of like hate batman um mm-hmm. so at the end of part one uh robert thorne that that um gangster is like blackmailing harvey he's like i know your secret meet me at this acid plant because of course that's there's like so many of those in gotham and that's where <laughs> super, that's where super villains are you know born um so b- big bad harvey is what they dub his like bad alter ego um shows up with the meeting and starts beating thorn up um but then thorn's thugs kind of get the upper hand batman kind of follows him there um and while he's sh- uh, while Harvey is chasing after Thorn, um, one of the gangsters think aims a gun at him. So Batman like knocks it away to misfire it, but the bullet ends up firing like an electrical thing, and Harvey falls, and then uh, the elect like sparks like <laughs> fall into the vat of acid, and it explodes, and his face is all deformed, and Batman's horrified. <laughs> but then it gives him a legit reason to kind of like hate Batman. Yeah, I mean that. Y- that it's a really good point that I didn't think about because I mean Batman can be sweet even when he's actually Batman with some of the villains, but the positions they put him in in this show and they've done it in the comics, but it makes sense a lot of I mean, maybe Two Face shouldn't continue to be a villain later on, but yeah, I mean yeah. it definitely it makes sense on why he focuses on Batman and why he becomes his villain. Yeah, exactly. And I feel like part two uh, really obviously focuses on, like, Two-Face is born. He's now a gangster, bad guy guy. Um, (laughs) (laughs) But one of the more interesting parts of this episode, I think, is his connection with his fiance Grace. Um, Mm -hmm. And she just brings out a very humanizing element to Harvey slash Two-Face, even when he's, like, in the midst of madness. Because it's, like, in the climactic scene um, when he's about to kill... Um, Robert Thorne, he's like flipping the coin, and that's when Batman like d- like dumps a whole case of coins on the floor, so Two Face doesn't know which one is his <laughs> and where it landed, which is hilarious, by the way. And they use that in Batman Forever. <laughs> yep, yep. <laughs> as a way of stopping that from happening. Um, but but Grace is like begging him not to do this; that the law should be the one to kind of deal with the gangsters or with the thugs on the street. And Harvey's line: "The law." Uh, the only law is the law of averages is just like so chilling. That's but a really good line. I know. I love that line. Um, but the episode kind of ends with, I mean, obviously uh, Two-Face being taken into c- custody, but Grace still is like, I'll, I love you and like by his side. And it ends on the note where like Batman flips a coin and he walks away before he sees what it says. But he's kind of like almost praying for Harvey's soul at this point. And he was just like, is there any redemption for him? He flips the coin and it lands heads up implying like yes there is but Mm -hmm. don't really do anything with that (laughs) (laughs) he comes back later and he's still a villain so yeah exactly Uh, so i'm just like what was that even supposed to mean it was a beautiful (laughs) sentiment but it was so goddamn sad and i mean one of the things to the show's credit was this continuity that it had so I, i think you sort of suggested this already but the fact that they had had harvey dent in earlier episodes it yeah. was a really intriguing, interesting character. Remember the Poison Ivy episode that comes out prior? She tries to kill Harvey Dent. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so you care about him, and then this happens. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And and I think after Harvey Dent uh, becomes Two-Face, you can feel that it's one of Batman's greatest failures, and it continues throughout the series. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. I feel like because he doesn't know a lot of his villains pre villainy, (laughs) that Harvey kind of has a special relationship with Batman, or at least the reverse, where Bruce Wayne is kind of tormented by his failure. Well, not to even mention that they were friends before he became that villain. Yeah, exactly. So it's always sad when friends become villains. It is sad. (laughs) (laughs) But yeah, that's the end of my first spotlight. I really like Two Face, and this is kind of where it Mm -hmm. began. That was a great. That's a great episode. I'm so glad you picked it. Because uh, I, I thought about doing it, and I was like, uh, I picked some other ones, but I was worried we weren't going to cover it. So that's great. Yay! Um, so my first episode. It is a single episode, a one off, and it's. I don't know if you guys are going to remember this, but it was one of my favorites, and still is. It's the man who killed Batman. <laughs> um, I don't know if this is ringing any bells, but it probably will. So it was it, obviously. Yeah, I know you, this episode. You know. <laughs> uh, it's it's funny and quirky, and I'll explain mm-hmm. it a little bit. It's uh, I think like all almost all of these are written by Paul Denny and directed by Bruce Tim. You know, that's kind of the general idea. Um, but the the story is basically about this low level hood uh, named Sid who is just going along on this routine drug run, uh, and. He the he's so like an incompetent and cowardly klutzy nerd, <laughs> and the rest of the criminals only have him there as like bat bait. They sort of suggest, you know. Oh. So Batman comes out like throw the nerd at him or whatever, and, <laughs> and that's kind of what happens. Which now that I think about it, what a good strategy of these criminals. But um, <laughs> but so he he's so clumsy he almost in in this tussle with batman on the roof of this building he falls off and batman goes to save him he saves sid the uh but batman himself falls into this like um gas propane tank or something that's leaking uh and and it explodes and everybody thinks that batman died and that sid killed him mm-hmm. um, uh, and this and he didn't even do anything. He didn't he just do fell. anything. <laughs> but the, the rest of the, the hoods, right, see him up there struggling with Batman and see that happen. Everybody knows it's kind of luck, but it's sort of like, well, I guess Sid, and they call, start calling him Sid the Squid. I guess he killed the Batman. <laughs> um, and then, you know, so it, the funny thing is, like, Sid, who's just this uh, otherwise, like, nice, affable, wannabe criminal, he thinks that his life is going to be greatly improved because he just, like, off the Batman. Instead, it puts a gigantic target on his back. And so every you know criminal in town wants to off the guy who offed the bat um, but that's the best case scenario because who but the joker finds out that sid killed the batman and he oh, doesn't no. take yeah he doesn't take it too well um yeah, cuz so they're he, they're lovers they love each other yeah ex- exactly so he he like um you can imagine too if you don't know uh this is a joker dominant episode uh mm-hmm. and which is great so you get mark hamill's fantastic joker performance and um, and it's it's we get two things which I really love, which you got to see in the show. Funny as hell, Joker, and really scary, Joker, mm-hmm. and they sort of both coexist at the same time. But so when Joker is sure that Batman really is dead because he doesn't foil some robbery, Joker actually has a funeral for Batman, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and that he has uh, Sid there for, and then at the end of that. Uh, he puts Sid in the coffin and has it fall into acid. That's the plan. Because, you know, again, it's this is one Joker had planned to kill on Batman. That would be his major, like, stroke of genius, his final sort of thing. And also, I mean, you know, there's a lot to say that Joker doesn't want to kill uh, Batman. Yeah. <laughs> you know, they, they need each other or whatever. Uh um, but yeah, so, you know, he does get saved at the end by Batman who, you know, spoiler alert, never died. Uh, he and why is him. that? Uh, well, he, he swung away <laughs> before he could explode. So he didn't, he didn't explode, but, um, but it was, uh, but he, uh, used it to watch, uh, how Sid was connected to the drugs in the first place. And it was Rupert Thorne and that, you know, near end of the episode is, Batman just beating the shit out of Rupert Thorne for being uh, a drug boss. Yep. Which is funny because he doesn't he doesn't seem to connect him or arrest him. He just punches him in the in the face. (laughs) (laughs) I mean he seemed to usually Yeah. He seemed to usually do that with villains that weren't like the Joker or Two Face and stuff. Like the just the kind of like drug crime ones that he would always just beat them up and then the episode would be done and he's going back to the cave and Alfred has food for him. (laughs) 
Yeah. I'm like, what, what happened to them? <laughs> you know, it's a great philosophy. Batman's like, what are you, extorting a politician? I'm going to belt you in the mouth. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> um, but I really... I, I love the episode because I think it has a sense of humor and it's well written and it's got this adorable character in Sid the Squid. But uh, another thing I really love about it is just the idea that it's um, Batman through the lens of an onlooker, uh, through through like a kind of normal civilian mm-hmm. character. Yeah, I love I love things like that. Yeah, it's really cool because, like, you know, Batman in a lot of ways is sort of bigger than life in this mythos for anybody that lives in Gotham. So rather than being from his point of view, it's from, like, one of the hood criminals' point of view. And that point of view change, I think, makes this episode just a little stand out and really (laughs) wonderful. It's a really good one. I mean, I I really like, like, the one-off kind of silly, fun episodes like that. And there's quite a few in this series of those, especially when Joker's involved. It's always great. That's my personal all right, so I'll go to my second one then. Yes. Um, I second one is from season three. It's episode twenty, so it's fairly deep into that season, and mm-hmm. it's Baby Doll. Do you guys remember Baby Doll? Yes. No, but I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> it's so sad. It's it's one of it's a heartbreaking episode, and also kind of terrifying at the same time, because mm-hmm. Mary Mary Doll. So she. She was a child actress, but she suffered from a disease that prevents her from aging. So she's just always perpetually in that child state. And so like this episode really deals with like the dangers of like clinging to the past, exploring like nostalgia and stuff like that. And so she being an adult but still looks like a kid, she decides that she wants to be back in the spotlight. That's what she craves. She still wants to be the actress that she once was. So what does she do? She kidnaps all her former castmates and holds them hostage. Of course. <laughs> but it's also kind of scary because it's, I mean, she looks like a doll. So she's a little girl. She looks like a doll and she's doing this. And all her castmates are older now. And they're on the old set. So it's just, it's, it's a kind of creepy episode, but then it deals with her and Batman. I mean, of course he doesn't punch this little grown woman in the face or anything like that. (laughs) But the episode ends with her crying like at Batman's feet because like he just, he gets her to realize that like you're, you're done. Like you can't go back to where you were. So like it just seeing like this really sweet and tender moment of like Batman not punching somebody and like <laughs> using his other like emotional gadgets in his belt to really connect with the person that he clearly sees that has some you know issues and needs help through it. I mean it's it's such a very well written episode. It is by Paul Dini, uh, so of course it was a really good one. But um, it's like the movie The Orphan. But better than the movie The Orphan. <laughs> oh, f- by far. It's so much better than that movie. But yeah, I mean, it's just, it's just a heartbreaking episode. And I think like it really showcases Batman's other sides. And there are quite a few episodes that do that. But I think just with the talent that was in this one, the story that was there, and then this particular, I don't want to call her villain necessarily, but Mary, Mary Doll, which is funny because she's called Baby Doll and her last name is D-A-H-L. So, you know, comics, how they like to, like, keep names as what they are. <laughs> you know, I, I think this episode is you, it, actually this weird textbook episode, and then it has these moments of brilliance that just set it way higher than not just the ones on this show, but just general television episodes at all. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so you know, they they structured sort of normally at first where it's like, okay, it's a bunch of these uh actors who are being kidnapped or whatever and you know there's some sort of pattern and batman's trying to figure it out and then you find out who the baby doll character is and there's Mm -hmm. a gimmick to the villain and there that's your adam west level batman episode right but the stroke of genius is you get these moments in the middle of that episode where they show exactly how shitty hollywood treated baby yep um, the, she tries to be a serious actor and it's, I, I think that the, the show didn't pull any punches and it's so to the show's credit because for Batman's villains, a lot of times it's like, oh no, the world was shitty to you. You had a bad life. You're not, you know what I mean? Like, and uh, it's almost like Batman's like, 
I totally get that you're not supposed to, you know, uh, shoot people <laughs> and I have to stop you, <laughs> but you're not wrong. Yeah. Yeah. And that, that's one of the biggest things that he does in this episode for her. I mean, she just wants to recapture like that magic of when she was where she wanted to be and people loved her and she was at the top of her career. And it's Batman's job to kind of guide her away from that and also trying to save all these people's lives. It's just, it's so well written. It's so good. Can, can we also, I want to, I want to stop here and say, this is why Batman doesn't kill. And this is why it's important that Batman doesn't kill. Yeah. Now I'm not, I, I, I understand some people are feel the other way and I, I get the logic to it, but the logic to Batman not killing isn't just some Magoo like, Oh, it's bad. It's that his characters have so much humanity, his villains that mm-hmm. He doesn't want to just, you know, uh, what do you call it? Like rub them out. He wants to help them. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's why he takes them to Arkham. I mean, yeah. granted, they should be in Arkham, but like yeah. <laughs> he does take them. He does take them to Arkham. And I mean, as far as him killing, like he does and he won't hold back on like, you know, an army of parademons because, yeah. you know, they enlisted and they're doing this willingly. But like somebody like Baby Doll or even Two Face or people that are just going through something. I mean, it's kind of funny. Batman just decided, like, yeah, he wants to instill fear, but he also wants to be a caretaker at the same time. Hence why <laughs> why he's adopted so many kids. <laughs> and and honestly, this the animated series was deeply engaged with just that project because uh, there are a bunch of episodes where Batman deals with their rehabilitation. I mean, a lot of times these villains fail, but I can think of three or four different episodes specifically where it's about the characters trying to go well. There is a there's a Killer Croc, a Riddler, a Harley, and a Penguin episode about them trying to go straight, uh, and it doesn't work out for mm-hmm. various reasons. And Batman is you know engaged in trying to help them, or at least you know being there to witness it um that is way more than than most stories uh, engage with yeah i mean it's not just it's just not the the superhero like fighting the bad guy and then you know being done with them and wiping their hands with them i mean there's a lot of the episodes that end with you know the villain kind of they're not mad at batman they're just like okay i see i see what what happened and then they, you know, of course they get taken away by the cops or whatever, but there's a lot of, there's like closure with a lot of these stories and with villains yeah. and with Batman, which is really, I mean, you don't see that really too much in like a Batman comic <laughs> or a Superman comic. I mean, it's a lot of punching. <laughs> no, it's true. The show had a gravitas and a humanity that we, you just don't get to see much in the genre generally. And that's why this is such a gem. All right. So it, it's. Kind of like the one that Jared picked. Um, it's a one shot called Almost Got Him. I think it's episode <laughs> 35, but I love this episode and it's these types so of episodes good. so much. <laughs> it's so good. So basically, the premise is um, some of the villains, uh, the Joker, the Penguin, Two Face, Poison Ivy, and Killer Croc are gathered at like a criminal only club called like Stack Deck <laughs> Club and they're like hiding from the police and it's uh, them just sitting around a poker table talking about the time they almost got him they almost killed Batman um, <laughs> <laughs> I just think some of the stories are pretty hilarious um, and the episode it turns out you know like the twist at the end which I'll get to is super cool uh, and got me <laughs> as a child honestly um, but so uh, just a little rundown of all of their stories oh by the way it's also influenced by a four issue arc I can't remember when the this series of four issues came out in Batman comics, but it's based on um, a four issue art called Where Were You the Night That Batman Was Killed? And the only similar like bad guy that's sitting at the table in that comic issue is the Joker. I think Catwoman and another uh, the Riddler are in the comic version. Mm-hmm. Um, but so uh, starting out, Poison, Ar- uh, Poison Ivy story is she put like poison gas inside some pumpkins on Halloween and it goes off when they're lit. Um, and basically the the people of the city are actually starting to feel the effects of the gas and Batman investigates and poison Ivy attacks him uh, with the gas weakens him. However, uh, Batman programmed the Batmobile to run Ivy down. So he like hits her with a car (laughs) 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 and then later pulled the breathing mask from the vehicle Uh, vehicle. He's actually able to capture Ivy. Um, And then fun fact on this story is the writer intentionally, um, had Poison Ivy setting fire to Christmas trees, but the network was like, you can't do that. 
<laughs> you can't set Christmas trees on fire because they were afraid of, you know, the religious folks being like, what? What are you doing? <laughs> Is that some symbolism to, that they want to burn us all down? <laughs> yeah. Or like destroy Christmas, Christianity, you know, blah, 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 blah. So yeah, the network mm-hmm. was like, you can't do that. So we switched it to exploding pumpkins. Um, <laughs> Whoa, completely different holiday. <laughs> I know, right? Halloween, you can take a stab at. Um <laughs> Uh, Two Faces story, um, kind of a, a robbery at Gotham Mint for two million dollars in two dollar bills. Which you know, I mean, the two motif gets a little overdone during this episode. Like, I feel like all of his hands have like twos or fours as derivatives of yep. twos, and it's kind of ridiculous, but it's hilarious and at the same time. He, he was being helped by the two ton gang too. Remember? Yeah, exactly. Yep. <laughs> Uh, but I, I feel like this is the most hilarious and iconic thing. Um, he straps down Batman to the head of a like a giant coin, which should seem mm-hmm. familiar to you guys, because it is always <laughs> seen in the cave now as memorabilia. Uh, but he like launches Batman up into the air on this gigantic coin or attempts to. Um, and Poison Ivy at the end of the story is like, what happened to the coin? And that's when Two-Face was like, they let that bastard keep it. And yeah. <laughs> from then on, you just see the giant coin in the Batcave. <laughs> I like how Batman's like, you know what this cave needs is a giant coin. <laughs> <laughs> Memorabilia. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> he becomes very prideful in that. Um mm-hmm. But Killer Croc's story is, I think, the most hilarious for many reasons. Uh, But when it's his turn, he's like, (laughs) they were like, so how did you almost kill Batman? He was like, I threw a bat. I threw a gigantic rock at Batman in the quarry. And the other villains are just kind of like, what? And he was like, it was a big rock. (laughs) I gotta gotta do it because it's the best joke in this show's history. Because he interrupts them. Because he's like, he slams the table, he's like, my turn! And they're like, okay, and he's like, there I was, I threw a rock at him. <laughs> it was a big rock. <laughs> yeah, it's so good. It's so funny. I know, it's so great. <laughs> and then the penguin story is kind of, I think, my least favorite. He breaks into an aviary at a zoo, because birds, and then... Uses the dangerous bird to try to kill Batman and uses his umbrella gun to try to kill Batman. It's honestly not my favorite. He captures him. The end. Um, you know, if, if Penguin had like a rhino attack Batman, he'd probably win just because like Batman wouldn't see that coming. Uh, that's very true. He's like, I, I thought you only used birds. They really need to break away from their motifs to throw him off, you know? Yeah. <laughs> uh, and then last but not least, the Joker story, which ends up being obviously the most relevant. Um, but they they take over a block of Gotham and break into a late night talk show. And his gang is holding the audience hostage. And <laughs> Batman goes to save the audience um overpowered obviously he's strapped to this creepy electric chair and the joker doesn't think the audience is laughing enough so he puts some laughing gas in there and then harley's just starts reading from a phone book and they start cracking up <laughs> just to build the scene it's very joker-esque and very terrifying but also like what yeah the, what the hell is happening he always loved to capture audiences like and not just with jokes but like literally capture them <laughs> <laughs> He likes being on stage. Oh, yeah. Um, but Catwoman breaks in and, like, helps free Batman. Um, but she's also captured after, like, the Joker flees. Um, Catwoman, starting to gain on him, was knocked out by Harley Quinn. So uh, kind of the twist of it is that while the Joker is, like, sitting at the table explaining the story, he's like, yeah, and currently uh, Harley Quinn is strapping Catwoman to, uh, like, a table in a cat food factory about to make her into cat food, (laughs) which is horrifying, but also it's like... (laughs) Punny and hilarious. <laughs> and that's the first twist of the episode. Yeah. yeah. And the second one happens right after when Killer Croc goes, I don't think so. And Batman's voice stands up and it turns out Killer Croc was Batman in a Killer <laughs> Croc costume the whole time. <laughs> so Batman is the one that made that joke. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, and it's kind of based off of something from an like earlier episode, so it's like that's probably how Killer Croc would tell the story. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, that's so funny. <laughs> I know. I wonder um, if like Batman himself would like whenever you know he did the whole well it was a big rock like maybe he was like maybe this wasn't a good story to tell because <laughs> like, it didn't get any traction. <laughs> no, but I think it was how- like it's in character. This is totally how I'm playing it. <laughs> Or it turns out Batman is just like a really bad storyteller. <laughs> <laughs> that could also be true. Uh, but there's this moment, too, when he stands up going like, ha, 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 I got you. Now I know where Catwoman is. That There's like a moment of like, oh, shit, because he just interrupted a table of his like powerful villains. They're all just staring at him like, dude, now we're going <laughs> to actually kill you. Yeah. And it's revealed a third plot twist that all of the other villains and patrons of the diner are actually like police officers in disguise. It was a sting operation. So, like, Harvey Bollock and Commissioner Gordon are there. And then Batman goes to save Catwoman in the end. But it's hilarious. Yep. <laughs> yeah. It's like, oh, twist. And here's another twist. <laughs> <laughs> Well, and the episode ends because she's like, after he rescues Catwoman, she's like trying to flirt with him. And then he pulls one of his like disappearing acts. So she doesn't even get to her punchline before Batman was just gone. She's like, huh, I almost got him. And it's like, oh, title drop. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, no, I love this episode for a variety of reasons, but it's also just like consistently hilarious to me. So. <laughs> Oh yeah, it's fantastic. I mean that like like we said earlier, like these fun like one shot goofy episodes are what makes this series so strong. Also, because they yeah. all can't be serious and you know stuff like that. But. And and that episode, by the way, uh, it hooks you so hard in the beginning because we hadn't on the show really seen that that much with that many villains in one place at one time, just talking amongst themselves. Yeah. And they have a they have a bar apparently that they go to like what the heck yeah <laughs> like Joker making fun of everybody and then there's actually in that episode there's a moment where Pamela and Two Face go back and forth because they used to date and Poison Ivy tried to kill him yep <laughs> yep. <laughs> <laughs> and also just like the joker every time you show, show his hand he has like another ace so it's like just heavily yeah. implied he's just using like aces he basically just has all of his aces <laughs> up his sleeve to cheat and just every little moment and detail of this episode i think is freaking perfect mm-hmm. yeah you, i mean it's it i mean just think about how sophisticated that is in the span of like 20 minutes you've got this hilarious framing device that we could watch an entire episode of if we could just watch 20 minutes of that you get to have four little adventures and then it has these like this meta quality that one of them is happening now and then you have a big twist with batman at the end being a badass that yeah. is <laughs> cra- it's d- multi-dimensional badass mm-hmm. <laughs> Okay, my my final pick. Um, I actually before I get into that, I have to mention this because I forgot about it from my last one, and I'd just be remiss if I didn't mention it because there's a line that Joker says when he thinks Batman is dead, and I mention it because this was Mark Hamill's favorite line he ever said as a Joker, and it oh, was dang. without yeah, it was without Batman, crime has no punchline, <laughs> <laughs> and I just thought that was brilliant and worth noting. Anyway, okay. Um, but my uh, final episode is Feet of Clay, part one and two. Can you guess what, what it's about? Clayface! <laughs> it is! Um, and I think I picked this for a number of reasons. It's one of my favorites growing up. I just re- like I remember it so distinctly because a Clayface as a villain is so striking and so dramatic. Um, but I also think that it just has, even though it's not when you look at like the top ten lists of the best episodes, it doesn't stand out because it doesn't have this creative literary conceit. But I think it's so solid in almost every way and has all these elements that you love. In you know, so um, one I just the, just right up top, uh, Ron Perlman plays Clayface. How do you get better than that? <laughs> And then Ed Bakley Jr., if you're unfamiliar, he's just a really popular uh, sort of comic actor, plays Germs, which is, again, what I was talking about earlier. He's just some, like, stooge. And he just, the level of talent that that guy has to just be this foppish guy who's afraid of germs. Anyway, okay. Um, 
So the the way the episode it's a two parter, and in the the first one is sort of the origin of Clayface, the first part, and then the second one is sort of like kind of a re- revenge thing. But the idea is that Matt Hagen, who uh, if you don't know in the comics, there's about nine different people who've been Clayface. Um, Basil Carlo is the guy that sort of in the if you read it in the comic, he's probably the Clayface they're talking about. But for, they went with Matt Hagen because Matt Hagen was an actor. Mm-hmm. And so the idea is Matt Hagen, this actor was in an awful accident and it scarred his face really bad, but he's found a drug uh, that helps for a short period of time fix his face. It's kind of, uh, what do you call phlebotinum, like super comic science or whatever. But the problem, <laughs> the problem is that it's produced by none other than Roland Daggett, mm-hmm. um, who's actually played by Ed Asner. But anyway... Um, he, uh, if you know him from the comics, Roland Daggett is like uh, always competing with Wayne Enterprises, but he's also connected to organized crime. So he's like evil Bruce Wayne or something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, when uh, he, he, they basically make Hagen, the actor, sort of do, uh, they extort him because he's addicted to this drug. He needs it. So they get him to do small level petty crime and stuff like that. And when he, um, basically fails and tries to sneak and steal more of the, the clay chemical that helps his face, Roland Daggett's men grab him and like basically force feed him this gross drug. They pour it over him and they show it in shadow and everything like that. And lo and behold, he turns into clay face. <laughs> <laughs> Which is a really, I mean, it's a really brutal way to, like, that that scene, I remember that specifically, and you said they show the shadow, but it's it's still kind of, it's pretty violent for, yeah, like, the, for the cartoon. It's the, Foley, it's the Foley artist, like, the sound of him, like, glugging as he's, like, mm-hmm. as that's happening. Yeah, um, because they're choking and, him, and, like, I mean, it's, ugh, it's crazy. Yeah. Yeah, it's awful, and and it's a tragic story too because it's it's again Ron Perlman, you know, uh, expertly acting this part of a a person who's kind of narcissistic and stubborn, but otherwise a good person who's just trying to get by, who's become an addict, who wants his old life back. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the second half of this, of course, is uh, you know the uh, we begin the episode with the Clayface in sort of full form, and you get the two things that Clayface visuals are really good at. One is kind of shape shifting into normal people, you know. So there's a kind of like, oh, which one's Clayface? And he kind of comes out of nowhere. And then when he becomes the big Clayface monster, he has all of those cool visual tricks where he you know turns his hand into a big mace or like different like knife like sort of things or smothers Batman. Um, and I uh, don't want to spoil it, but of course, Batman does foil his plot. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so it was kind of cool as an episode because the idea is, you know, he's not, at this point, he's just mad at Roland Daggett, and it's like a, a, him trying to get revenge. And so Batman's trying to save this asshole who really deserves to get got. Um, but, and he ends it in a really cool way, the way, cause he's having a hard time beating Clayface, cause Clayface is like a, even in the comics, a kind of high level superhuman compared to Batman, you know? Um, so, but the way he stops him is he kind of gets him locked into a room with a bunch of TVs, uh, that all have, um, pictures of like roles that that matt hagan had done like different uh videos of his uh, his acting yes his old yeah exactly his old parts and they kind of establish a court like through the episode that this for a lot of what clayface does is sort of a reflex so he kind of can't decide his body can't decide which thing to turn into and it confuses the system and then he like electrocutes himself on accident um, <laughs> Poor but guy. The, in, the end scene where he's like uncontrollably turning into all these sort of different uh, characters at the same time, including himself and Bruce Wayne and stuff like that. It really it looks it's like Carpenter level scary like in, 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 in a way. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, and so to me, this episode just had everything. It's It's got beautiful animation. It's got tragic story. It's got Batman being a smart scientist, figuring out what's going on and being a detective. It Is he really, though? In in this, yeah. Okay, I'm, I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. Because <laughs> it's usually the bat computer that really picks up the heavy lifting, or sometimes <laughs> randomly Alfred is like super really smart. Oh yeah. So, like, <laughs> Did you just insult <laughs> Alfred? No, like lightly, like just a tiny bit. <laughs> oh man, Alfred is super sassy pants in the show too. Oh for sure. I mean, they're all. I mean, the characterization of all of them are super great. Uh, yeah, and just real quick, so we we don't not mention it. Just since you mentioned that, Alfred, Commissioner Gordon, Robin, uh, Catwoman, the 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 supporting cast here is also just great. Mm-hmm. And, I know. Yeah. 
Well, you know something about the Clayface episode is that the comic writers at DC loved it so much that that's kind of like it became the accepted interpretation of the character. Yes, yes absolutely. absolutely. So. Yep. Yeah, because I think that's who it is now in the comics when it was um, in Detective Comics because Clayface actually joins them, which is kind of odd, but it makes sense in the comic. Just read it. <laughs> but it, it's it's Matt and it, you know it's the actor, so it's it's really interesting that they kept it and still going mm-hmm. on with it. Yeah, that's it. That's our animated series. <laughs> yeah, no comic book Rex. Just watch the episodes we talked about as well as all of the episodes because they're amazing. Yes, it's a masterpiece. And then we do have to do one thing before we go. So our lovely new Patreon subscriber, Sean Fleming. So we have to give him a superpower and a name and or background and or all of those. (laughs) (laughs) Well, you guys can help me with this, but I, as soon as I heard the name uh, and we've been talking about Clayface, I think it would be really cool if Sean Fleming had kind of like a phlegm based power. Um, And, you know, we've seen that in comics before, like with Toad, where he could like, you you know, uh, shoot like kind of mucus and stuff like that. Yeah, but that I didn't think... do anything. Exactly. So that's the innovation. We go further where he kind of produces this phlegm that's super powered and almost like quasi sentient. So he can use it like a Green Lantern, where he can make different <laughs> shapes out of the phlegm. He creates like phlegm armor and stuff like that and, and different phlegm so, constructs. So like his peak power level and ability is right in allergy season. Like, oh, that's, that's the best. I mean. And and Claritin is like his big kryptonite. <laughs> Mucinex is. <laughs> is this like a villain yeah. power? I don't think a hero power would be this gross. Or it, I like to think of him in the gray, like a mucus gray. Yeah, he's I like see. he's like Venom. He's like Venom, but like it's not an alien. It's you know his mucus. <laughs> I see. Okay. <laughs> okay. Mm. Okay, Jared. What's his name? Uh, God, this is that's naming stuff so hard. I was thinking we could go with like Mucor, maybe, or something like that, you know, because he's like an alien from a different planet where this is actually not gross and deeply sexually attractive. <laughs> okay, I'm down for that. <laughs> and and in comic fashion, it's like M U H dash K. Oh, jeez. I just I love the idea of him being like what. What? Every time he uses his power here? <laughs> yeah. And he, because from his planet, it's can, the person who's the most like attractive is the person who has the most virile uh, kind of like, vital <laughs> mucus. He thinks he's a stud. <laughs> That's awful. Hilarious. I love it. I, I apologize, Sean. Or you might like it, but <laughs> you, you subject yourself to this when you become a Patreon subscriber. <laughs> All right, guys. Thanks for listening. Follow us on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter at The Phantom Zone Pod for more podcast updates.